Good afternoon and welcome to the National Center for Family Business at DCU. This is the second in our series of webinars and the title of this theme and the series we're undertaking is Lockdown to Recovery. Got a fascinating array of speakers, academic speakers, industry experts and family businesses who are living and breeding this lockdown situation. Our first keynote speaker is John Sutherland. John comes with over 40 years experience working with the ECB. He's an expert on finance and legal services, and he's gonna give you some really rich insights around risk and financial risk. This situation and the post COVID situation, and even other scenarios that we're facing in our, in our Irish context with regard to Brexit, it's gonna really stress test our family businesses. So what does the financial risk look like? What does it mean to you as a family business? And can we ask and can we delve into some of those really difficult questions? Our second keynote speaker is Professor Jim Davis. Some of you may have met Jim, who was with us last summer. Jim's gonna to talk to you about a, a fascinating topic, the topic of innovation. Now the word innovation, strategy, growth is used in our mainstream media day in, day out. But Jim's expertise is innovation in a time of crisis. I'm delighted to welcome three industry experts from our partners, PwC, AIB and Beecham's. They're gonna give you their insights from working with you, the family businesses of Ireland some of their key takeaways and some of their nuggets of advice for moving forward in this experience. I'm then delighted to have a very special opportunity where we get to travel to the oldest city of Ireland, the city of Waterford. And I'm delighted that we're being welcomed into the Dooley Hotel in Waterford. We're gonna have two keynote speakers from the Dooleys, Tina Dar and Margaret Dar. And what makes this family business, fascinating. It's a third generation family business. And it was founded by Tina and Margaret's grandmother. And it's been led across all the generations by women. It's a seven, 70 plus years family business. We're gonna go, we're gonna visit them in Waterford. We're gonna see some nostalgic pictures of the past and scenarios they faced in the past. And you know, difficult times that this family business have had. I'm gonna go share almost like a fireside experience with them. We're gonna move on where you get an opportunity to have a panel discussion, to you know, ask your questions, any comments you have of our industry experts. Just to explain to you how, how you can get involved, if you wanna raise a question or comment to any, any of our speakers. You can of course, first email familybusiness at dcu.ie. So familybusiness at dcu.ie. If you want a private message on Twitter or LinkedIn, so you can obviously remain anonymous, you can give your name, whatever you want. We're raising a lot of topics that are very sensitive, very relevant and fundamental from lockdown to recovery. So please enjoy the webinar and I encourage you to get involved. Our first speaker today is John Sutherland. John is an honorary fellow of the University of Exeter Business School. John's career spans over 40 years in financial services. He spent 35 years at Lloyd's and Nationwide. He has been a special advisor to the Bank of England's Special Resolution Unit and CEO of Stroud and Swindon Building Society. John has been a senior advisor at the Financial Services Authority and was seconded to the Parliamentary Commission on Banking Standards. He is now a senior advisor at the Bank of England, where he is closely involved with the supervision of banks and insurers. In addition to work at the Bank of England, John is a member of the Audit Committee of the European Investment Bank and an advisor to the board of the Jamaica National Group. John regularly speaks in the UK and abroad on leadership, corporate governance and risk management. Welcome to this session on return planning, also known as bottling the brilliance. I'm going to open up with two broad questions and the reason I'm doing that is because I want you to think beyond the survival of your organisation to where you were trying to get to in a previous life. So last year you went through a planning process that looked something like this. You looked at where you are today, 
You looked at where you'd like to be in your planning horizon three to five years out, your tomorrow. You looked at the options of how to get there and you made some choices and all within your risk framework, the risks you run and how you mitigate them. Great. And then came COVID and your tomorrow box became how do I get back to work and how do I survive box and all your objectives become very, very tactical. It's really important that you don't forget your tomorrow. You don't forget that you're trying to get somewhere in a three to five year period, as well as just trying to survive the now. Now the objectives might become very different from where you set them in 2019 because of COVID, but don't forget you have to get there as part of your risk framework and also bottling that brilliance. The great collaboration and working that we've seen in many organizations, how do you carry that forward tomorrow to your new organization. So let's take these three headings and, and I'll give you a shorthand. Now, it feels very odd to use the word safe uh, given the crisis where so very many people have tragically died. Broadly, what I mean is the whole workforce and broadly the whole population is in a safe state. They know what they're doing, they're back home. There's a feeling that actually they're quite like where they are and they don't want to make a move. And now what we're going to do is say, look, this precarious world of transition, here's some more change for you. You've just adapted to this huge change with all the mental health issues that run alongside it. And now we want you to change again. So let's not minimize what we're asking people to do here. But tomorrow, there is a bright horizon out there, a new tomorrow, and it does exist. We can be sure of that. I look at organisations through tasks and people, and I want to look at today and return through tasks and people. I want to look at tomorrow in terms of bottling the brilliance. And let's not leave the bottle on the shelf and admire it and say, wasn't it wonderful when we went through COVID? So, lockdown happened. And for some organisations, a week or two before lockdown, but from lockdown, everybody is trying to work out what can be done from home and what can't be done from home. And, and at both extremes, you have the organisation that can do nearly everything from home, perhaps only IT security and premises security on site, against the organisations such as a tourist attraction or a restaurant where you have to be on site to do the job and perhaps only the bookkeepers can work from home. And this defined who was likely to be open, who was likely to be closed. And you have to say likely because in the bottom category, of course, you have all the supermarkets and you have the delivery firms who've kept working all the way through the crisis, even though they're on site. So if we take our tasks, there are three issues facing the tasks. And this is outside of the great big people issue and the response to the change issue. This is about tasks. So whatever on-site working, whether it's some or all of it, it's essential that you tackle this and decide how you're going to deal with this as you go back on site. People have discovered that their remote working technology is less secure than being on site and consequently there's less information available remotely than there is on site. So taking you back to this model of planning, under the three headings, I just at this stage want to look at today and return. So we have our three issues today and we're working from home and we're working to fix the technology. And what's emerging in these sorts of organisations is the need to define why you want me to go back on site because it appears to me I can do everything from home. Now we are social beings. One of the needs for going back on site is definitely around leadership and culture and conduct. But we need to be clear about why we want people to go back on site. What's the gain? If you increase secure access to increasing amounts of information you will increase your working from home possibilities. That sums up into one word, flexibility. You will make your business model more flexible and the key to the door is secure access. The more you can secure the access to information, the more flexibility you build into your business. And interestingly, the issue, the sub-issue that's coming out is the classification of information. How comfortable do you feel about having a top secret document displayed on a screen in somebody's home? How comfortable do you feel about call centre information displayed on a screen at home? Okay, let's move to the on-site working firm who is also fixing their technology. The total focus has to be on social distancing. How do I get my business back? 
And what's the impact on the business model of this social distancing? And it's interesting to look at the different levels of social distancing protocol. So in the UK, we're working on two metres. French study shows that in a restaurant at two metres, you can serve 30% of the customers that you normally would. And there's a half a percent chance of infection. At one metre, it's 70% of the customers you would normally serve, but there's a 2% rate of infection. So clearly, there is a link between social distancing and your business model. At 30%, you probably have a non-viable business. At 70%, it might be more viable. Well, it will be more viable. The question is whether it is viable. And there's a real risk in these sorts of businesses. As you're analysing your way through social distancing, you forget about the technology. Your bookkeeper is at home. Insecure technology, ransomware attack, and the whole business is taken down. So the, the, the significant risk in these sorts of businesses, you forget about the technology because you have to obsess about the social distancing issue. So that's tasks and the different challenges that lie ahead. Let's look at some of the people issues. Uh, let's do a good old Boston four box, working from home and on-site working. Most employees will, with reassurance around social distancing and hygiene and the commute, fall into box B. They'll be willing to work from home and willing to work on site. Ultimately, that'll be most people. But you have to recognise amongst your workforce, there will be people who can't work on site because either they have underlying health issues or they live with somebody or associate closely with somebody with underlying health issues. There will be some people who will not wish to work from home because it's difficult. Perhaps the accommodation is very cramped. Perhaps they live with very difficult people, but they will want to work on site. The office is the great leveller. Everybody has a minimum standard of workspace in the office. That is not true at home. And the will not, will not are the people who've decided after seven or eight weeks at home that they don't want to do this anymore. If you did an online survey with your staff, few people probably will opt for C. They don't yet want to admit it, but ultimately that will be the case. So you have to think about how are you going to address all of these issues because you don't want to force the box A and the box D people to do things they don't want to do. Okay, let's look at this. What is the necessity to get you from today to return and on the way to tomorrow? And the short answer is it's medical. It's the foundation and it's the keystone. And you need to be very clear what triggers a lockdown. So it's really simple if it's a UK-wide lockdown. The R8 goes to three and everybody's locked down. That, yeah, we know that. If you've got 50 people in a building on two floors and one person tests positive on the second floor, what do you do? Do you clear the whole building? Do you just clear the second floor? Do you just clear a block of desks? When do you deep clean? Your employees will want to know the answer to those questions. And that's partly about you need to have the flexibility to go back, not to think that you're simply going to go forwards. You might get partial lockdowns. The telephone call that comes in and says, track and trace has told me I need to socially distance myself, self-isolate for 14 days. Or the telephone call that comes in and say the school has closed and my children are at home for two weeks and I need to be homeschooling again. The flexibility that organisations need to offer their employees has gone up. Okay, this rather busy slide we looked at before, let's make it less busy and let's now look at tomorrow, which I glossed over. And these are high level, for example, to get you to think. Okay, you'll see as we look at our on-site working company, they fixed the remote technology. There's more information now available remotely. So what? This means they have a more flexible business model. It means as well, if they've done the social distancing work sensibly with an eye to the future, they've completely revamped the customer journey and the customer experience. So it's not just about hand sanitizers at the entrance. This face-to-face -face business is totally dependent. You need to be seen, perceived as the most hygienic place on the planet because this is your reputation now. This is what you need to build, is reassurance for everybody who comes onto your site to enjoy your facilities. And strangely enough, you have the opportunity of a new online business model because you've revamped your technology, 
and all of your consumers are suddenly highly skilled at video conference pub quizzes on a Sunday evening. You have a whole new audience out there for your business. How do you exploit that potential? Looking at the working from home business, again, we fixed our technology, so this is where we are now. And we have a more flexible business model and we probably have lower real estate costs because the answer to the question, do I need to come in nine days out of 10 and please can I work every other Friday from home has become, can you explain to me why I need to come in any days? And you might have people that are working three days at home. You might have to because your building can't cope with the whole of your workforce in it at the same time. The face-to-face -face business model, your client visits, you visiting clients, clients visiting you, is still going to be there. And it also will be totally dependent on social distancing. But what of course you now have is a new economical international reach. You do not have to pay business class to get to New York anymore. You can transact around the world because the whole world has learned how to video conference, share information and collaborate with it which is a terrific new opportunity. But don't forget that the rest of the world will see the UK as a terrific new opportunity, so you have more competition. So these are very high level examples to get you thinking because everybody's business model is going to be so different. And you'll be pleased to know this is the last slide. So as a reminder, the keystone, the foundation is medical. You need to be clear on this. You are going to have to answer these three questions for your employees before you can bring them back on site. And you will need a set of business requirements for your business. You need to be very clear with people what happens when a test is positive in different circumstances. Your employees need to feel that on-site working is as healthy as working from home, and that includes the commute. That there is a clear business model, model to be on site. If you're, a, if you're a tourist attraction, obviously it's clear because if you don't come back on site, we go out of business. But for a lot of businesses, it's not that clear. And you cannot be in a position where people have to come on site because your technology is ropey. Your working from home has to be easy and possible. It's morally indefensible if people are on site because you won't let them work at home and you'll find it's legally indefensible with the health and safety executive. Once you've gone through those three steps, then tomorrow is your oyster. Thank you very much for listening. Tina and Margaret Darher from Doolies Hotel in Waterford are now going to share their experiences of lockdown and how it has impacted their business and their family. Firstly, the name Doolies came from the Dooley sisters, Kate and Molly Dooley, who started a business here in the 19th century. Um, my grandma it changed hands on a number of occasions before our grandmother purchased the hotel in 1947. She relocated from Dublin with a small child, our mother, and they took up residence here in the hotel. At that time, the hotel had eight bedrooms, a range that burned turf, and eight cups with handles. They didn't have ensuite bathrooms at that time, and it was very rare for a woman to run her own business. Um, as mum grew up in the hotel, they lived here. Mum um, organically came into the business herself, and she studied hotel management in Calgary Street in Dublin, and returned to the hotel in the 1960s. Um, the hotel was, we, they had um, increased the bedroom size to 43 bedrooms and in the 1980s they purchased a building alongside the hotel and put on a 150 seater restaurant. Um, they then reconfigured the hotel again um, and to put on all the rooms to have all en suite and we had 34 bedrooms. And today we are a third generation women-led business in the heart of Waterford City, Ireland's oldest city. We have 112 bedrooms, a 150-seater bar, 170-seater restaurant, and a 220-seater banqueting stroke conference suite. Well, there's three of us in essence. Uh, Mum, who's retired, but still plays a very active role in terms of coming in every day and does quality control. There's Tina and myself. Um, we restructured the hotel and we um, bought the original part from Mum and now we currently own one third each of the business. Um, Tina, uh, we 
our journey into the uh, business was slightly different. Um, Tina went and qualified as a Montessori teacher and then returned to the business in 1994 and did a business degree with IMI. I had always known that I was going to do hotel management and worked locally in different hotels um, and went to Calgary Street myself. Um, and in 1995, I got the opportunity to go to the States um, on a North-South partnership and worked for the Ritz-Carlton and worked there for three years and returned to the business in 1998. I suppose the pandemic has hit everybody um, by surprise. It hit our industry like a tsunami. Um, overnight, um, we lost all of our business partially um, off the books. Our international tourism is completely gone for 2020 and I reckon it's going to be another four to five years before we see international tourism return to the levels that they were at. Um, I suppose in terms of the business, um, we quickly made decisions and um, very difficult decisions to stop all of our the essential um, aspects um, of the business and the hardest decision was to cut our team by 83%. I suppose one of the most significant um, frustrations of COVID is the sense of powerlessness and the inability to plan for the business. Um, and I think that's been really frustrating as things change um, hourly, daily, weekly, monthly. We're well used in this industry adapting, but it was at the speed of the changes um, we found very, very frustrating. Which we certainly saw last Friday, considering we've been now moved a whole month ahead of where we would have been. We were told we were opening at the end of July. We're now opening um, at the end of June, which was a substantial change when you're considering taking employees back and having all the measures that we required that we required to have in place um, before we open. So the family, we um, we we could consider while well, you can see we're not social distancing on the couch here. We have considered ourselves as one unit throughout the uh, lockdown, um, as we work very closely together. Tina and I work in the same office and we have continued to do so over the lockdown, being in here every day. Um, and also Tina's daughter has been in with us. So we, we do consider ourselves as a, a unit, um, a fa one family unit during the lockdown. Um, we have been very lucky that we work well together and we also socialise outside of work together. Um, and to while it has been physically and mentally draining on us, watching the business close down it was very, very sad and very surreal the day that we locked closed down the bar and we walked out of there thinking when will this reopen again but what we have done as a family is that we meet once a week where we have a social distance uh, meal with our mum outside uh, every Saturday just to, to um, keep her spirits up because she lives on her own. Mum has done that since she's four, she's been in this hotel with people all around her and now she's at home on her own. And I'll never forget the first dinner that we had um, Mags had the linen tablecloths, the candles, flowers. It was just, oh my God, it just lifted my heart. Oh, we are well used to crisis here in Dooley's <laughs> Hotel. Um, my grandmother and mother um, always had the force of nature. Um, the hotel is located on the River Shore in Waterford. So every year, a couple of times a year, the water of the River Shore um, flooded in um, to the building here in the hotel. We've gone through 9-11, um, we've gone through foot and mouth in 2001. Um, also when we did, went to do the redevelopment um, of the hotel, trying to secure finance was um, also quite challenging. And then eventually in the winter, at the summer of 96, one of the original banks came back to us and offered us finance to complete three quarters of the project. We closed the hotel in 1996. Um, in 1996, or sorry, in January 97, um, there was an arson attack on the hotel and the financial institution that we had um, decided to go with weren't, shall we say, they didn't handle the situation very well. And we took the second option and they financed the whole of the hotel but again, six weeks prior to opening 80% of the hotel, we had another arson attack and it put the project back months. And we had a lot of contracts and we had to reaccommodate all those guests that summer. 
Um, but we were lucky those people stayed with us, the tour operators stayed with us and are still with us today and we managed to actually bring the project in on budget. We've coped generally um, quite well um, during lockdown. You know, we've been busy here in the hotel um, every day. I suppose the homeschooling side of it um, was a bit of a disaster, to be quite honest. Um, my 11 year old was here in the hotel and she actually preferred to help out any of the team members that were here rather than do her homework. So we've, we've uh, had her being trained on, she now knows what uh, Legionnaire, Legionnaire's disease is and how to prevent it by running the taps. She goes around with all the team members and uh, helps run the taps every week um, to prevent uh, the Legionella bacteria coming into, into the hotel. Well, what we have done is we've got into corners that have we haven't seen in a while. We have done, uh, we've re re reinvested in the kitchen. And um, the kitchen is very, it was probably one of the areas that was the oldest part of the hotel um, in terms of the flooring. We have put in a new floor in the kitchen, uh, which was which was in some ways easier during lockdown because it didn't impact the kitchen. The kitchen would have had to be closed if we were in an operational uh, situation. So we went ahead with that. And um, we also have a still room, which is a, a section of the hotel, which provides teas, coffees with restaurants. And we, we did, resh we reshelved in there. We did the floor in there. We also pulled out the laundry and repainted uh, and kind of done back house stuff, back of house stuff that needed to be done, uh, but has given us the opportunity to do so, which meant that we were able to keep our um, maintenance person on board during the whole of the lockdown and he was able to continue with those things. So we've cleaned, we've painted, but they probably, like our guests won't see the difference on those. The employees certainly should. Um, for health and safety, it's, it's a much better solution for them. Uh, and we also completed um, an RFDI lock solution, which gives guests the mobile um, solution to use their phone as a key and also they can also check in and check out of the hotel. It has the facility to do all of that. Again, I suppose there's more associated costs with that. So we want to ensure that the uptake would be fairly great before we give the outlay on that. And we also managed to rent out a little unit beside the hotel. So some good things did happen during lockdown. We've also been able to deep clean the hotel from top to bottom. Um, we had just prior to uh, lockdown or before COVID had hit Ireland, we had invested in a type of steam cleaner. So every bedroom has been steam cleaned from the curtains to the carpet, uh, mattresses. mattresses, everything has been done um, since, since we have lockdown. Well, we are going to definitely reopen um, on the 29th of June. We just actually received our guidelines yesterday. So we're in the process of going through those guidelines. Yeah, we've also, in terms of it, for training wise, we've sent out, as I said earlier, we have sent out all employees training. Uh, we have to relook at the way we're going to operate. Initially, we were told the bars were not open until August. This is an area that we use as a, a, our full restaurant during our quieter periods as we're very seasonal. Um, with the announcement on Friday, we are now going to be able to reopen that area. So there, there are certain challenges. Before we had a breakfast buffet, which will no longer be there. Um, so we are looking at how we service our guests in the best possible way so that they're comfortable and safe and so are the team members comfortable and safe which is the key to it because I think the human aspect of people uh, will come out in this and um, people are nervous and they want to be reassured and that's on both sides of the counter. Oh we're optimistic and um, obviously we're, we're nervous and um, we've lost a lot of months of revenue and um, generally here in Waterford, you know, it's kind of a seasonal business. And um, so we are, we, we can't wait to open and have the, the team back, but we are nervous in terms of revenue, revenue generation. And, you know, it's not long before we're going to go into, I suppose, another lean time. And please God, um, we won't have another setback in, in terms of COVID.
in terms of being a third generation business, um, I suppose we're hoping on the resilience that we've had in the past, that we've managed to get through all the various different things that have come our way. Um, as you've said, my mum has gone through the North-South thing during the 70s when that was at the height of the season. So we are hoping that our resilience that we have managed to last, we're on the third generation, we've been in business over 73 years, that we're, we're positive and, and hope that we will be able to continue with what we have done over these last three generations. And we have another generation that um, possibly may come on board, so we want to make sure that it is ready for them. Our second speaker today is Professor Jim Davis. Jim has been a long time collaborator with the National Centre for Family Business. In June 2019, Jim took part in our event, Building Trust in Family Business, which launched a research undertaken by our own Dr. Catherine Faherty. Jim has been with Utah State University since 2011, where he serves as Professor, Management Department Head, MBA Programme and Executive Education Director at the Huntsman School of Business. Jim's areas of specialisation are strategic planning, family business, change management, entrepreneurship and international management. Jim's research interests and publications are in the areas of corporate governance, strategic decision making, trust, stewardship and social capital. His articles have appeared in many publications and Jim has worked with a number of companies throughout the world. It's a pleasure to be with you today. Um, actually, it's this morning in the Rocky Mountains in the United States. Um, today, my topic covers a lot of ground. It will, I plan to talk about family business resilience and innovation in a time of crisis. Um, that's a big topic. And uh, I'm going to cover this topic by sharing with you some research that I have done. So let's go to the next slide. And uh, the approach I'm, I took with this research is what we call a social forensic anthropological approach. That's a lot of words, but basically is what that means is, is I went out and I, and I interviewed and visited hundreds of companies all over the world. And it's what I wanted to do was find out what the best businesses do. Let's take a look at the next slide. This was my question. <clears throat> what are the things that successful family businesses, what are they doing to survive and thrive in a time of crisis, in a time of disruption, um, some external shock to the environment? And basically is what I found, a number of things that, that successful companies do, but is what I'd like to do is focus on just two of them. And I think these two are the, are the core of, of what I found. So let's go to the next slide. And these are the two. Successful family businesses in crisis have a sense of meaning and purpose that companies that struggle don't have. They also approach strategy and change differently. And they use something uh, called, I call pivoting, strategic pivoting. And I wanna take a bit of a deep dive into both of these. What is this meaning, this core purpose for family business? What is this pivoting? And, and unpack that and how we can do that during this time of crisis, during this COVID crisis. Let's go to the next slide. <clears throat> This is a man by the name of Viktor Frankl. Uh, Viktor Frankl um, lived in Austria in the 1930s. He became a, a neurologist and a psychiatrist and a specialist um, and worked in hospitals and became fairly well known, was working on a manuscript on his research. Well, this was about the time that the Nazis took over Austria. Viktor Frankl is a Jew. And he was arrested and put into a concentration camp. Now, as any scientist, the first thing he did was began to look at the people in the concentration camp. 
And over the course of the war, he was in four different concentration camps, ended up in, in Auschwitz. And he was put on a labor detail in Auschwitz. And it's what he asked was, why, why were some prisoners, why did they live and survive and others die immediately? He wrote a book after the war, uh, Man's Search for Meaning. And it's what he found was that the prisoners that survived in times of crisis found meaning and purpose in the, in the crisis. Quoting him exactly, he says, life is never made unbearable by circumstances, but only by the lack of meaning and purpose. Next slide. He also said, those who have a why to live can bear with almost any how. Folks, we're in a crisis and it's a global crisis. Believe me, as I heard the previous two uh, speakers and I've done research on Ireland and, and variety of countries all over the world, we're facing the same, the same challenge, um, forced isolation, um, complete cutoff in revenue for many businesses. We are facing our, our crisis. How do family businesses, successful family businesses, find meaning in this crisis? And to me, we find it in the next slide through family legacy. I love the previous presentation. You could hear their family legacy from the, from the very beginning of that presentation. A family business finds meaning through the family legacy, through the family. There's meaning and purpose in the family business that comes through that family legacy. It's amazing to me as I've talked to, to family businesses, they refer to previous crises they've struggled with and how they pull together as a family. The Dooley Hotel that we just heard, they meet weekly, they pull together, they face crises before, and this won't be the only crisis they face, but they rely on their family and that family legacy, that meaning and purpose to pull through. So the next slide. I've always looked at family legacy as the mortar between the bricks. The bricks tells us what we do. It tells us, okay, we have this service, we have this product, we have this supply. Uh, this is how we take in orders. Those are the bricks. The thing that makes the, the wall strong is the mortar between the bricks. And that's our purpose. That's our core meaning that we bring to the business. That's our family legacy. Next slide. Now, there's two types of commitment in any organization. There's something called continuous commitment and something called value commitment. Continuous commitment is when we're there because it's the best option we have right now. It's where we get our check. It's, uh, it's where I, I, I work. It's where I find uh, my job. And I'm going to stay with that job until something better comes along. That's continuance commitment. And that, my friends, is the worst kind of commitment. Um, the best kind of commitment is something called value commitment. And this is when you're committed to the, to the, to the organization, its values, its purpose, its legacy. Legacy is grounded on value commitment. It's something bigger than just a paycheck and a place to work. If, if you're value committed, you're there in good times or bad because you believe in the organization. You will see them through this crisis. You're not going to quit. Last slide. Next slide. So family business resilience is based on legacy. Successful businesses build legacy. There's a, an old Arabic parable that says, 
he who has no past has no future. Believe me, that legacy, those values of your business will lead, will, will strengthen your resilience through these difficult times. I have found that the successful family businesses who are resilient through crisis have a firm legacy. Now, one thing to remember is this crisis we're facing right now will further build your legacy. Okay, what happens right now for good or for bad will be remembered, will become a part of your values and it's going to strengthen that, that legacy. Build legacy. So next slide. Now we've talked about meaning and purpose. Let's move to strategy and pivoting. Next slide. I can tell you what we are facing right now is something like we have never seen before. This is something we had a booming economy, a booming global economy. Everything was up. And it's like somebody blew out the candle, flipped off the light switch, and everything shut down. People had to stay home. Companies closed. Um, we've never seen anything like this before. There was a lot of uncertainty and ambiguity. How long will this last? How bad is it going to get? When will we be able to open up? Which, which businesses are essential? And if those essential businesses, what is the essential part of that essential business? Hospitals um, no longer served um, discretionary um, medical uh, services, um, outpatient surgery, for the example, voluntary surgery, cosmetic surgery was all put on the side. It all went to COVID. Um, Grocery stores, immediately the food stores learned immediately which products really were essential and which weren't. And those products flew off the shelves and they became scarce. Nobody has ever seen, we haven't seen this kind of shutdown before. Next slide. Michael Tyson once said, everyone has a plan until they get punched in the mouth. The first speaker today talked about being punched in the mouth. We all had a plan. We were doing great. We all depended on that revenue stream and then we got punched in the mouth. Now we have to begin to think about things differently. We have to approach things differently. We need a new plan. Next slide. One thing I want to point out. Research shows that some of the best companies are built in recession and they were built by pivoting. I've listed four companies on this slide, Airbnb, Walt Disney, Microsoft, Mailchimp. If you look at their history, their defining moment, how they redefined and recreated their company for the future, it took place during recessions, during crisis. Next slide. During a crisis, we tend to focus on only essential customers, essential industries. And right now with the crisis we're facing, non-essential companies are really thinning down. And, and unfortunately, that's a lot of service industries. Um, and we need to rethink the way we, we plan for the future. And we're gonna do that through something called pivoting. Next slide. So family businesses, successful family businesses, when they go about their planning in a crisis, they pivot. It's a different kind of planning. It's a different type of innovation. Um, it's a different way to look for opportunity. So next slide. Here's what pivoting is. Pivoting is when you live on the boundary of your organization. You're not insulated from your environment. You're talking to your customers. You're spending time on the edge of your organization rather than the center. You're talking to suppliers and customers and government. You're talking to people in your environment. Um, pivot points are points of opportunity. 
You're listening for opportunity. You're listening for ways to pivot the organization. The Dooley Hotel, I love the, the description of their history because you heard their pivot points. You heard about them bringing in a hotel, or rather in, in a restaurant to their hotel. You heard about them expanding and, and offering different kinds of services. Those are pivot points. Those are pivot points. And it's what I've seen um, with our service industry here, um, with the businesses I spoke with, they have pivoted on different delivery modes to customers. There's been a lot more um, curbside service, um, delivery, point-to-point uh, -point delivery. Um, customer, the, the value change has shifted by the conditions. This disruption will help us pivot to define a new normal. Almost everyone I've talked with in a huge variety of industries say it'll never be the same. This disruption gives us the opportunity to pivot, define, and lead the new normal. Next slide. So with pivoting, we're looking for opportunities. There are shorter term planning cycles. We're looking for unmet needs in essential industries and markets. We're looking for new resources that have never been available before. And we're looking for customers who are ready to buy right now. Um, we are redefining our future. We're creating the new normal. Next slide. Now, here's the key. Once you find that opportunity, you've got to be entrepreneurial. And entrepreneurials work with zealous tenacity, high energy. They don't wait for a return to normal. They work with zeal and dogged tenacity to win. They do more with less. It's you, once you find that opportunity, it's you move forward and define your future. And I've got to tell you, we're doing that right now in higher education. Our classes stopped and we had to find entirely new ways of delivering our classes. And those new ways are going to be the new normal. Our students have changed. They're learning differently and they expect it differently. So last slide. So what I have learned through my research for us to be successful through the COVID crisis or any crisis as family businesses, we've got to build resilience and innovation by building that family legacy, that that meaning, that core purpose, and that's going to keep us together. And then we need to live on the edge of our, our organization, live on the boundary of our organization, find new opportunities, and as an organization, we define the new normal. It's great meeting with you today, and I look forward to answering your questions in the panel discussion. Thank you. We are now joined by Kira Fallon. Kira is a director in the People and Organization Consulting Division of PwC. She has over 20 years consulting experience, 15 of them with PwC. Kira is passionate about how organizational leadership and individual behaviors affect business strategy and performance. Kira specializes in helping clients navigate the people aspects of large transformation programs and business change. In particular, Kira's work with clients focuses on the area of organization design, organizational culture, change management and talent. Kira has been heavily involved in supporting PwC's response to COVID-19, in particularly helping clients to address the workforce challenges presented by the crisis and advising how organisations can safely return to work. Thank you for the introduction, Ellen, and for the invite to today's session. Um, if you can move on to the next slide, please. I suppose I just want to kick things off by anchoring the conversation around the return to work with this framework in terms of how we've tried to 
um, align our responses to the waves of the crisis and um, looking at six focus areas. Today I'm going to focus on workforce, but I suppose putting that in context of the waves of the crisis, I think most organisations now are in that, that middle phase of stabilise that you'll recognise from John's um, presentation, a similar concept there. And I think the key word here now is how we pivot, to use one of Jim's nice words, from stabilise into strategize, which is essentially seeing how every organization can emerge stronger from the crisis and return to what is the new normal. A cliche that's used a lot, but actually it's really, really important and true at the moment. Um, and what I'd like to do is maybe take you through some of those activities and some of those thought processes to help you pivot between stabilize and strategize. A, a key thing to remember here, I suppose, is, has already been alluded to, is the elasticity between these phases and the waves of crisis response and I think it's really important that all organizations are thinking now about what will happen if there is a second wave and starting to plan and base the lesson learned from what has happened heretofore to help get them ready for that response. So the next thing to talk about, I suppose, is the waves of decision making that will inform the return to work process. Um, and we've categorized that across four headings around the areas of health and safety, around um, the type of work in terms of the financial cost implications of the return to work and then employee preferences and needs. So the first one really is a relation to health and safety. So I guess what I would advise everybody to do is become extremely familiar with the return to work safety protocols that's been issued by the government. There's a really clear set of guidelines and instructions there about what organizations need to do to get the organizational workplace physically safe for the return to work for employees putting in place the proper protocols, putting in place the proper measures before people return, and then the daily routines and habits that will need to be put in place to give comfort to employees and customers and suppliers in that safe return to the workplace. So I'm on the red pillar there. Um, so look, we think it's incredibly important that we understand what the safe capacity is of your workplaces so that you understand what, what level of return to the physical workplace you can anticipate over time. Again, I would highly recommend caution around that and taking it slowly. I think most organizations are taking that approach to make sure that it's a purposeful return to work. And then it's thinking about the type of work. So what, what types of roles are best returned to the workplace? Again, a lot of cross-reference with John's work earlier on around how we need to align that with, you know, what are the, what are the operational dependencies, what operational resilience issues will be created by different roles and performed on or off site. Then think about the, the cost and revenue implications of that return to work process, specifically around what the cost will be to reopen, whether that's from extra security, extra cleaning, PPE, etc. So it's important there's a slide rule put over that return to work process to make sure that it makes sense that you ramp up to the appropriate level of capacity. And then finally, I think and incredibly importantly is thinking about worker needs and preferences. We all have felt at such a personal level, the levels of anxiety and, and stress and capacity constraints that have been cr created by the crisis. So I think it's really important that as employers, we show that duty of care to understand what those constraints are for our, our employees and factor those elements into our decisions around who return to work. I know there's a lot of detail on those slides, so I know we are sharing these with, with people joining, so you can certainly and take a look at those again after this conversation. Move on to the next slide, please. Thank you. So I guess it's really important now to think about um, the return to work process and the planning exercise that you will follow to it. So the first thing we would say to you is make sure that you have a dedicated team or task force that is looking at this for your whole business end to end. Um, you may already have some people that have never left the workplace. Um, so we need to make sure that you refresh your plans and your protocols to address them as well. You're, um, it's really, really important that you set some transition principles. So that's around the pace of change, what the level of duty of care is to your employees, how you are going to manage the whole supply chain in terms of your, your visitors, your um, suppliers, contractors, et cetera. What are the principles that you're going to apply to that return to work process? I think it's critical that we do a lessons learned exercise at this juncture too around how did we respond to the lockdown what kind of uh, issues did it flash up in terms of our operational resilience? What worked well in terms of the, the decampment from those workplaces? And what do we need to bear in mind as we go forward? I think it's really easy for organizations to continue to look at what's directly in front of them when they're trying to navigate through something as stressful as a return, particularly when those timeframes are changing so much in the, 
the reopening plan, which is, I know, welcome from, by most, but it does create extra pressure. It is really important to press the pause button at some level to think about where are we now, how have we coped so far, and what are the lessons learned that we want to carry forward. And then thinking about the process around applying those decision trees that we spoke about earlier on in terms of the return to work decision factors and putting a, a good set of scenario planning exercises in place so that you're thinking about the what ifs, what if we do this, what will the impact be, what happens if there's another wave, what types of groups can we bring back together in what combinations that will minimise close contacts and that we can make sure that we protect our employees, their families and our, our customers. We move on to the next slide, please. Again, I think it's important to not only look back to the crisis and think about our responses and how effective they were, there's also a, a, a need to pause and look forward before we make the leap back into the new normal. And this is to do with that pivot, I think that Jim was talking about, that strategic pivot, because it's a really good time to ask yourself the questions around the future of work in your organisation. And specifically around you know where work actually needs to get done what i found from speaking with clients in, during the crisis is that it has helped them to understand their organization in a different way in some in some cases it's actually revealed things that they didn't know about their organization where their vulnerabilities are where their strengths are where talent is living what kind of teams are working well together and i think it's really important that we take this opportunity to think about where does work really need to get done where could it get done and how will the work get done in the future? And how do you carry forward, if you like, the benefits, the unanticipated, the unplanned for benefits that have arose as a result of what that we all recognise was, was a, a very challenging and tragic uh, crisis for many. But there are positives to be gleaned, but we need to be purposeful about how we capture those, those, those sets of value and bring them forward into the new environment and the new workplace. So the pivot back to emerging stronger it should be done in that purposeful way to make sure that we don't just revert and swing back to the way things were before, but rather that we carry forward those positive benefits into the new ways of working. And our final slide then, please. I guess what I would hope was hoping to do with this slide is really start to plant seeds in all of your minds to start thinking about what types of elements or aspects of the future of work do I need to start thinking about from both the workforce and a talent agenda because you're at a point now where you can re-template out certain parts of your organization, whether that's your organization structure, your ways of working, your collaboration methods, how people work together, and how you innovate, how you develop new products and services, because we've heard great stories of things happening much faster than, than clients ever thought that they could, accelerating through transformation processes that they, that they didn't think they could achieve, and some of those barriers being pulled down. So how do we take advantage of that cleaner landscape and start to rebuild and start revisioning for the future? So it's thinking about your workforce of the future. It's making sure that as leaders of those family businesses that you're role modeling the values and behaviors that you think your company stands for. And I think that links into Jim's message around legacy. So how do you make sure that we are modeling and creating that psychological contract with our people that represents the core values of our family business? It's paying attention to culture and building engagement. The decisions that you make now about your workforce are going to have a lasting effect, um, both in terms of your current workforce and the stickiness of that workforce, but also your attract, attraction as an employer and your value proposition as an employer. Because the way that we behave now is to, tells people a lot about what kind of organisation we are, what we stand for, what we hold true. So I think it's being really conscious and purposeful about that too. And then thinking about the ways of working and how that can be repurposed, what worked well when we took away some of those barriers from the physical workplace that we want to recreate and replicate in the new hybrid working of on-site and remote. And then finally, I suppose a word around welfare and well-being. I don't think we can really count the cost yet of the crisis on our people and our, on our own resilience. So I think it's really important to pay extra special attention to welfare and well-being of our people as we transition into that new normal and make that pivot into a return to the workplace, whether that's physical or remote. Thanks very much for having me this morning. I look forward to participating in the panel discussion. Our next speaker today is Catherine Moroni. Catherine is Head of Business Banking Market at AIB Bank. She is Chairman and Non-Executive Director of AIB Corporate Finance. In February this year, Catherine became President of the Dublin Chamber of Commerce. She is also a non-executive director of the National Centre for Family Business here in DCU. 
and a former non-executive director of Aviva Health. Catherine is also a fellow of the Institute of Bankers. She is a strong advocate of community-based activities, including business, education and youth initiatives, with a specific focus on the Greater Dublin area, in particular with the University Business Incubation Centres. Catherine is a member of AIB's Diversity and Inclusion Board and is responsible for the AIB Women in Enterprise Business Owners National Initiative. She is a graduate of UCD Business School and has attended Cranfield and the European Management Centre in Brussels. Thank you very much, um, Ellen, and good afternoon um, to everybody that's listening and thank you for joining us. Uh, I guess with that introduction, what I would say to you is I'm, I'm involved daily speaking to businesses, all kinds of businesses, including family businesses. And what I'm going to do really today is just share uh, some of what we've been hearing and what businesses have been experiencing through this COVID period, and also uh, what's happening as businesses start to open up and what we can expect into the future in terms of supports, which I think is really important to be thinking about in terms of how you support your business. So we, if we can move on to the next slide, what I would say to you here is very briefly over the last 12 weeks, we've seen businesses adapt incredibly quickly. Um, some have had to close and provide staff subsidies. Some have remained open. And in many cases, we've seen complete pivots. There's that word again in some business models at a pace. And I'll speak to that in a moment. We've seen businesses responding very rationally. And I want to say that to you because just to show you some data from our business, thousands of customers, businesses have applied for loan repayment deferrals. And they've done that in what you'd almost say uh, an expected way. And by that, I mean, the businesses that have taken those loan deferrals are hospitality businesses, all types, tourism businesses, retail and subsets of transport, particularly those impacted by tourism or private bus operators. So they have been very rational. But I do think the next three to six months are even more critical than what we've been through before, because a lot of businesses will tell you that the cost of reopening is going to be more challenging than what they have been through already, because the, the unknowns there in terms of as yet what social distancing is involved and how customers will react to the reopening and indeed how staff will engage with that. What I do want to say to you about those loan repayments, and this is really important, is if you haven't taken those and you're thinking of taking them, just be mindful that they have to be taken by the end of June, because the EBA, that's the European regulations and that govern us, have said that anybody who takes those deferrals before the end of June will be considered COVID-19 specific and won't have an impact on their business. But if anybody looks for a loan deferral after the 1st of July, we're back to having to treat that as a customer in difficulty or as it's called an unlikely to pay. So just to be aware of that, um, it's really important, um, a small point. But even if you wanted to have that cash flow in reserve to, to cover the unknown, you can always pay it back early again later. I think that's important. And in terms of those um, costs that are ahead, I'm going to briefly touch on the government supports, not in detail, but just to prompt your thinking there, I'll move to the, the, the next slide there in terms of um, AIB. I'm not going to go through this in great detail. What I do want to say to you on it is that if you, if you do want to take that loan deferral, that telephone number in bold is a dedicated phone number um, for the AIB customers on the call. And all, all banks have those. You just have to look up their website. It's just a faster way of getting it, certainly speaking for us, because we've dedicated that to make sure we get through those for customers as quickly as possible. And there's a callback option there as well. The other thing I want to say to you is that uh, in terms of reopening, all the other normal solutions that are available are there. And it's really important to say to you that business as usual were, were available through all the normal channels to assist you in whatever you need there. So please do just get in touch with us, be that your relationship manager through our phone lines, etc. I'll move on to the next slide now. I'll just mention that um, it might be worth your while listening to podcasts. Many, many businesses have them out there. 
I'll mention ours specifically because in each of our podcasts, and we, we do them on a regular basis, we have customers, very like the Dooleys earlier, speaking about their experiences so far and what they're going to do next. And the striking thing I feel about this pandemic is the way businesses are prepared to share, be they professional businesses, family businesses, tech businesses. So we have tech, we've agri, we've retail, we've hospitality, manufacturing, they're all on there. And you can watch those even if you're going for for a walk uh, with your headphones in just to hear what other businesses are doing. They might prompt your thinking about what you might want to consider doing. To give you one example, um, just one example, we have a, a customer and this is this is exactly what Jim was talking about, pivoting and knowing what your core business is. Uh, a business that was the manufacturer of clothing decided to move very quickly into importing and finishing PPE equipment. And they were importing from Hong Kong for the first time. They were talking to us about using overdrafts and very quickly we suggested to them, look, we think you should use letters of credit just to help take some of the delivery risk out. Not all of it, but some of the delivery risk out. And that's really vital when you're trading beyond the UK. Countries don't tend to trade as much on, on open account. That's not just important for COVID, it's important for Brexit into the future. So just to mention that to you as well. And there's a contact number at the very bottom there for merchant services. If you are uh, moving to trading online, that might be helpful for you. So we'll move to the next slide. Again, very briefly on the government schemes. I'm not going to talk through these. I just want to make three key points in these. There are quite a few of them. The government did react very quickly. They have different qualifying guidelines, which are quite clear when you look into the different schemes. But again, your bank, certainly we can help or your business advisor can help you navigate through those because it depends on your size. They vary all the way from very small loans and small businesses, micro sized businesses, the Leos and MFI will help there right through mid sized with SBCI and all the way up to very large businesses. There's supports there for all of them. And what a lot of businesses don't realize is some of those supports are actually grants that don't have to be repaid. Um, there are grants available there to help you do your business planning. They're there for restarting business. They're there for helping online trading. So do you just think about those as a family business. They can all help you. And it's not even just the finance. It's the discipline it puts on you to think about your business and looking at the way you have to approach those and the questions they ask you. They may prompt you to ask yourself something that you wouldn't necessarily ask yourself. I'm going to move on to the next slide now, if I may and talk very briefly about cash flow management. And the reason I want to mention this to you is a lot of businesses would say to us at the moment, look, I'm closed. I don't have any revenue coming in. Why would I bother with a cash flow? I'm not going to go through the circle in full because you will have access to these slides. But what I do want to say to you is just start with your bank account, wherever that account is, what you have or not have in that bank account at the moment. That's fine. It's perfectly understandable. But work through what your cash needs are because most businesses do not fail because of a bad business idea. They, they run out of cash or they run out of credit or they haven't sought to get paid when they're due to be paid or they over gear. So there's a whole discussion on that another day. But I would ask you to just look at that and utilize online resources. There are lots of them out there. We have one called the AIB Small Business Cash Flow Planner over there in the second arrow, you'll see it. Even if you don't fill it out, if you go in and have a look at it, it's, it covers in detail everything you should be thinking about and it might prompt you to think about something you're paying at the moment there might be an opportunity for just deferring that um, for the moment that you might decide look I don't need to be doing that right now and the last thing I'd say to you is aside from watching your cash and your fixed costs is utilize all of your business connections many of us will talk um, and I'm guilty of this myself to our suppliers and our buyers and, and we talk most to our customers but the local county council, the Leos, the local chambers, DCU Centre for Family Business, your advisors, they're all really keen to help at the moment. Um, they're not charging for that service. There's very much a pull together and get the country open again. So, so have a chat with them. They will tell you what's going on. They will help you. Jim put it very well. Sit on the edge of your business. Reach out and bring that back into your business currently. I'll move on um, to the next slide now if I, if I will. And it's interesting, Jim and I didn't speak about this, but, but, but just in all the businesses I've seen over a very long 30 year career, those that stand out, it doesn't matter whether they're PLCs, whether they're global, whether they're family businesses, that ability to thrive and pivot and reimagine is so, so critical. 
And what I wanted to say to you there in terms of reopening and um, reinvigorating, just as a last point before we finish is, if you do think about, we're not going to go back to a previous normal. And when you're thinking about that purpose of your business, why you exist, and when you think about what your customers expect from you, do think about how their expectations have been changed. Because that process could lead to ideas for you, not just work patterns, which Kira talked about, so clearly there, supply chain patterns, transport, movement needs, the attitudes of your customers have changed, the processes you may need to use, the models. And the one thing I want to say to you is I've had a lot of discussions with customers, just be careful how you measure productivity right now, be that either from yourself or your staff, or indeed how your customers are behaving, because some businesses have been amplified in the demand. It's, it's fascinating as businesses, we've all seen the 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 coverage of different businesses opening up and the queues down the road so just be careful either under productivity or over productivity can just be driven by the moment we're in and so use this um, opportunity as well the last thing i want to say to you there is the global shift towards sustainability and the donut city both of which you can look up that idea that we need to be more accessible and if you're changing your business build in how you can get that sustainability element back into your business so, so that's everything from me. There's a final slide there and it will be available to you just with all those contact details, including the government ones, the podcasts and, and how to contact us. And, and thank you very much for your time. Our final speaker today is Paul Cott. Paul is a senior associate at Beaches. He specialises in employment law and advises employers on all aspects of the employment relationship, contentious and non-contentious. Paul acts for clients in employment claims including unfair dismissals, equality claims, occupational stress, health and safety, protective disclosures and trade disputes. Paul has considerable experience in advising family owned businesses on addressing employment issues which are unique to family businesses including planning for succession, incentivising the management team from outside the family and dispute resolution. He has extensive experience advising a wide range of clients, including private and public sector bodies and professional organisations on employment and commercial disputes. Paul's work over the last few months has understandably been focused around addressing the challenges presented by the COVID-19 pandemic. It has become more important to address urgent and novel queries in a tighter time frame, such as matters like the temporary wage scheme within hours of it being brought into law advising on the challenges regarding working from home, layoffs and collective redundancies. Thank you, Ellen. Um, what I'd like to discuss today is the issues that uh, myself and my colleagues are being asked to address uh, on an ongoing basis as the economy or business has moved from lockdown to recovery. And I suppose they're influenced by two factors. The first is that we're trying to advise on very novel and new issues in an unprecedented working environment using, I suppose, uh, old employment legislation or legislation, legislation which is on the books for 20, 30 years in many cases. And the other factor is which businesses had to make very uh, important decisions. So as Margaret and Tina outlined, they had to uh, make decisions related to their business effectively overnight. And that has influenced uh, the way that uh, the queries that we'll see over the next month. If you could just move on to the next slide, please. And the next slide after that, actually. So the immediate impact of COVID uh, affected from March, really when the schools closed, was uh, layoffs. Uh, and then the temporary wage subsidy scheme. And in many cases, uh, pay cuts and redundancies to some extent. Uh, but we're really starting to see those come, come around now. And it's really the unwinding of those decisions and those actions that are going to form the base of our work as we move from um, lockdown into recovery. So if you could just move on to the next slide, please. So layoff was always used as a temporary measure. It's a temporary solution uh, to a, uh, a cessation of work. So it was typically used where employers believed that, where employers could suspend the employment relationship for example, where there was a breakdown in a project or a break in the supply chain and they had no work on a temporary basis for their employees. There's no limit to, uh, to how long an employee can be put on layoff. However, the legislation provides that once an employee has been on layoff for four weeks or more, they can apply to be, to apply to be made redundant uh, by the employer and therefore receive a redundancy payment. 
the immediate concern then in March was that um, employers would be faced with uh, redundancy claims by employees and certainly I had a number of clients who had employees with 20 or 30 years of service and there was a real concern that, that if they applied for a redundancy payment scheme or redundancy payment that, that would put a cash flow pressure on the business. However, under the Temporary Measures Act, the uh, government has suspended the power of employees to apply for a redundancy payment. And that uh, suspension now has now been extended until the 10th of August. Once the 10th of August comes, as things currently stand, employees who are on layoff for four weeks or more will be able to then apply for a redundancy payment. The other factor of layoff now is that we have a number of, play number, number of businesses will have employees who are on layoff um, uh, but now need to consider about bringing certain numbers of staff back to the workplace. And it may be the case that they don't need all of the staff that they ha uh, had prior to uh, cessation of business or prior to lockdown. And so they now need to start considering how, on what basis they're going to bring employees back. In other words, how are they going to select employees uh, who return from layoff? Because in effect, what this may mean is that the employees who aren't brought back immediately may ultimately, ultimately may be made redundant. And so, in fact, you have a procedure now, which is like a redundancy selection procedure in reverse. What I would advise employee, employers to do is to uh, ensure that they uh, use a, an objective, uh, clear basis for selecting employees who return to return from, uh, from layoff to avoid possible claims at a later date. If you move on to the next slide, please. So, uh, in common with 2008 and 2009, we've seen a number of pay cuts. Uh, I, my experience, pay cuts seem to have gone a good bit deeper than the last time. Um, I would always advise employers to get consent of employees to before they impose a pay cut. So typically, I would advise the employee, employer to write to the employee, ask them to sign an acknowledgement at the bottom of the letter consenting to the uh, pay cut. A lot of employers have been reluctant to take that step, um, but I would certainly advise it uh, to protect from future claims. And the other thing that uh, the other factor that uh, employers need to bear in mind is that when the pay cuts were initially imposed, perhaps in March or April, they may not have had clarity then as to how long the pay cut would last for. And so perhaps it's now time uh, for those employers to start communicating with employees again to explain that to even explain whether or not a review is ongoing, ongoing of pay cuts or whether pay cuts are likely to be permanent. Um, uh, so yeah, if you can move on to the next slide, please. So redundancies, um, unfortunately, we're starting to see increase in redundancy queries. Um, uh, up to now, it really hadn't been a feature of the crisis, but as businesses start to make hard decisions about their employees and workforces, we're starting to see an increase in queries in this area. Um, again, uh, on this area, it's important for uh, employers to remember that or to yet to know that um, the Workplace Relations Commission and the Employment Appeals Tribunal before that expect employers to embark on a consultation process with their employees prior to making them redundant. And that applies whether you're dealing with one employee or more. What I would always advise employers to do is to first put the employee at notice, uh, notice of their risk of redundancy, so uh, and then follow that up with a consultation meeting where the employee can uh, put forward their own proposals for perhaps avoiding the redundancy and then uh, finish it off with an outcome meeting. But there are plenty of cases in the, uh, from the WRC where employees have been found to be unfairly dismissed, even though the redundancy was genuine, but the processes used in making that decision were found to be unfair. The other uh, consideration to bear in mind is the numbers of people who are being made redundant. So I set out on the slide there, the numbers of the threshold for being a collective redundancy. Uh, and I've been asked to advise a number of collective redundancies in recent weeks. Where a collective redundancy imply, uh, applies, the employer is under a strict obligation to enter into a 30 day consultation period with employer employee representatives. Um, whether or not they rec rec recognize, whether or not they, they're used to dealing with uh, representative groups or not. Um, and they're also obliged to notify the Minister for Employment Affairs as well in advance, uh, 30 days in advance of making any employee redundant. And there are strict penalties uh, and fines for employers who fail to comply with that consultation requirement. Um, just one word, other, word, other word on that as well. Uh, on a practical note, um, I've had a number of cases here where employees uh, have been on the, the uh, temporary wage subsidy scheme, and it appears that it is difficult to get them to to marry up the system between social, uh, the social, social welfare and the and revenue, so that uh, where employees are on the scheme, uh, 
um, they, if they find it difficult to then go claim benefit from their office, from social welfare office. So it's important for employers, if they are taking them off the TWSS, to issue a stop notification to the revenue as soon as that happens, uh, so that the uh, employee's PRSI class can be changed. That appears to be a bit, glitch, a bit of a glitch in the system and hopefully it'll be resolved soon. If you can move on to the next slide, please. So, uh, as Kira has uh, outlined, um, and I think John earlier on, um, there is a real drive at the moment, or sorry, a real feeling among employees that they uh, would quite like the status quo to continue. That is a, a working from home, perhaps with a combination of work. Certainly, the uh, I think there's a survey from the NUIG, which said that 83% of employees uh, would like to maintain a, a working from home um, to some degree. Um, I haven't seen a similar survey from employers. Anecdotally, my understanding is that most employers would like to see employers, employees back in the workplace for productivity reasons. Um, and there's maybe a central tension there then between employers and employees. Uh, and I think that's something for employers just to be aware of. If you can move on to the next slide, please. So as we move back into the workplace, uh, there are some issues for employees to employ. Those are some of the issues that employers will be asked to address. As Kira outlined, the work, return to work protocol comprehensively sets out for employers their obligations in relation to employees in the new working environment. Um, and what I would say is that I think it's time, employers need to start planning for those individual queries uh, that are going to come about. For example, how do employees who have uh, childcare obligations, uh, how are they going to return to work? Uh, I'm sure many of us are still in a situation where our children are off school and are effectively being reared by Xbox. Um, and it's going to be difficult for those employees to return to work on a full-time basis. And employees, employers may need to consider developing a policy for those particular employees. Um, the other uh, concerns as well will serve concern around how do you deal with vulnerable employees? And again, most of that is dealt with in the guidelines, but uh, those are the type of issues that you can see arising. I think it's employer important for employers to remember that they have a comprehensive, most employers should have a comprehensive grievance policy in place. And that's the appropriate form for dealing for any with any kind of issues on a return to work basis. Um, if you could go on to the next slide, please. So really just summing up there, uh, and again, I've been outlined in previous slides. Um, we're returning to work, hopefully returning to work shortly. There's an obligation on employers, again, to provide um, uh, induction and training for employees when they return to work. There's also an obligation to provide, provide employees with pre-return to work form, um, which should be issued to them prior to returning to work. And if you go on to the next slide, please. So just finally, I suppose, just summing up in the takeaways. For me, the best of the employers who will fare best at this will start planning for the return to work. In other words, they'll start planning for uh, communicating with employees informing employees what's expected of them when they return to work, informing employees who are in difficult, keeping in contact with employees who are in different difficult circumstances, whether or not they're living with vulnerable people or how are vulnerable themselves. Um, and then one of the features of the, of the protocol is, is the emphasis on collaboration with employees um, and the election of employee reps. And I think that that's going to be key in moving this return to work is the collaborative approach between employers and employees. So uh, thank you very much for your time. And I understand there'll be a queue question and answer section soon. Folks, you're very welcome back um, to this lockdown to recovery. Um, we have about 10 minutes um, for, for some panel questions. Uh, probably first and most important, I hope the five minutes was enough time to, to get a, a tea or a coffee for you. Um, as I said at the top of, of this webinar, um, a big word for us actually is heterogeneity and what I mean by that is uh, as you sit there hopefully with your cup of tea uh, there's other family businesses right across the country and um, families of different sizes different industries different generations you know different owners whether they're male female family non-family and I'm sure you have lots of questions um, it's evident from the Twitter feed and um, we can see it from from LinkedIn and some of you have emailed us at, at, at familybusiness at, at dcu.e. Um, one thing I, I will dare say give you my word on is I know from the last webinar, we got a lot of emails um, and people asked about 
Eric, you spoke about particular questions or topics or this speaker spoke with that. Can we get more information? And one thing we're, we're committed to do is if you do send us an email, we will send you back information. So I know, for example, from the last one, some people wanted more information on, you know, the role of family constitutions, what's a family, you know, governance structures with regard to shareholders agreements. So if you are interested and you want to find more, find out more, please, you know, do drop us an email. I'm going to start off with, with the panel questions. Um, obviously, probably like most of you sitting here today, I haven't been on holidays and it's coming up to holiday season. And, and Tina and Margaret, you did a phenomenal job and you showed us your um, family business. And we're all very much looking forward to getting back into, uh, especially Waterford. Um, I'm an avid cyclist and I, I very much look forward to doing the, the Greenway um, in, in your beautiful city. But I look to you for my first question, um, and it's one we've got from, I'm actually delighted to say it's come from one of our next generation members um, of, of the university. And this next generation members are concerned about, they've had practices which they've done in the past. Are there any practices you've learned from COVID that you're gonna to have to implement in the new tomorrow? Well, I suppose um, the first one Catherine alluded to was um, the cash flow um, statement. And as we saw the cash burn um, out of the business, and um, we were trying to see where we can stop it. So we've actually perfected, I suppose, that a little bit better. And we found an omission um, where somebody was using part of our utility um, and that we had omitted to bill them. Thankfully, now they've actually said that they will fulfill the contract and pay yeah, the flow is, is a big one. Operationally, um, I suppose, for, in terms of the staff, uh, we've, Staff have seen different roles. Their their roles have been diverse. The ones that have stayed on with us, um, and they've seen how the other person works. So we'll probably keep a good aspect of that going forward. Whereas we'll do role reversals, or we'll maybe do a day where somebody will go into the other person's role, so they'll have better understanding of it. Great, great. I'd love to ask you the question about Lord Waterford, um, and maybe we can catch up on on that the next time. Um, Jim, I've got a, a question, and thank you to Tina and Margaret. I've got a, a question um, for you, if possible, please. Uh, just to give you a little bit of an, an insight, um, I've known Jim for probably 10, 12 years. We're involved in the, the STEP project. And STEP um, looks at or addresses entrepreneurial mindsets in family firms. So really nice thing about some of the families we have in this country is where you see multiple generations, like fourth, fifth, like, for example, uh, with the Duty Hotel, where we see multiple generations of a family business leading and driving this family business. So, Jim, my, my question to you, and I actually have two questions, if, if that's okay. Um, but my first question is, you know, if you are in a family business and you've had this long tradition of how we've done things and you want to do things a little bit differently, any thoughts or guidance on doing things differently to maybe what you've done for a long period of time? Yes, I, great question, Eric. Um, honestly, um, part of my background is a psychologist as well. I'm a licensed psychologist. And, and I can tell you, people are creatures of habit. Organizations are creatures of habit. Um, there's something called strategic inertia. And when an organization goes down a particular um, way, it becomes habit, it, it defines them. The nice thing, if there's one nice thing about COVID and a crisis, is it creates a disruption, a significant emotional impact. And I can tell you in psychology and organizational uh, theory, those, those moments are redefining moments. That look at it as an opportunity to redefine the business, change the course and change the way you've been doing things. It's very difficult to change a business um, or a person when things are going very, very well. Most people re entrench and they resist change. It's that significant emotional impact that creates that opportunity for change and an opportunity to do things differently. Uh, so in a way, uh, COVID presents a, a, an organization an opportunity to change. Opportunity to change. And I've got a question. And the reason I asked this question, um, this is based on, just to give the, the audience, I suppose, some context to what we have in, here in, in DCU. Uh, any given year, we've about 300 students who come from family businesses, just like you, uh, as you sit here today. 
And the question a lot of the next generation have um, is, you know, when do I get involved? Who do I speak to? Do I have a mentor? Do I report to mom or dad or whatever it might be? And COVID now has very quickly given them opportunity that they didn't think before. So, for example, mom and dad are not too tech savvy or the top management team are not too tech savvy, but I am and I have an opportunity. Jim, do you have any guidance or thoughts if you're a next generation member and you want to take that leap? into an opportunity in the business another great question you know if i were to add a third point to my presentation beyond pivoting beyond purpose and meaning um it, it would it would be teaming and uh and listening to new voices um frankly it does open the door for the next generation the fact that um, that technology has become so critical. Um, it has opened the door for that next generation who are typically more tech savvy. Um, I can tell you the best example I have is um, my university itself. Um, all of a sudden we had to go to use technology to instruct our students. Um, and old professors who have been used to standing in front of the class and teaching it the traditional way have now had to reconsider their classes in entirely new ways. The most successful professors have engaged students, the, the next generation, that know that technology and have partnered with them in their delivery. So it's, it's partnering with the next generation, opening up those new conversations. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. Um, John, I'm going to come to you next, if, if, if possible, please. Um, John, you, you've over 40 years experience, um, obviously working with the University of Exeter, but also working with the ECB. And so you've seen SMEs and family businesses, all different sizes, industries, generations. Do you have any practical steps with regard to risk and financial risk management or any practices our family business could instill? Uh, I'll do my best. I, I think I think the main thing coming out of COVID is to actually group the risks. And the two that I would think about most of all would be the reputational risk that sits around um, what people view your business in terms of its protection for COVID. And that's inside and outside. So what are your practices in terms of protecting people coming into the business from outside? And what are your practices for protecting your employees? And that needs to be thought through, as I said in the, in the video presentation, what do you do if you get a positive test with one of your employees or somebody who visited your organization? You need to have answered all of those questions and discuss them with your workforce as to what your reaction is going to be. So that's, that's the kind of the health side of it. And the other side is the finance side. A lot of businesses have gone into this crisis and nobody imagined that all of your income could disappear. But across, you know, it's not just the hospitality sector, it's across many sectors. Take airlines, take holiday travel agents, income has disappeared. And, and I think the, the realization that there is a need to have the ability to bridge a gap if a gap appears again. So now we're prepared with the thought that we could be locked down again. There could be a local lockdown that stops things happening for a short period. We're seeing this happening in Beijing now. So the thought of how you finance that lockdown, it's not going to be wasted effort now. So is it that you are going to have to think about retaining cash in the business in a way that you didn't previously? And is it that you need potentially to line up standby finance with your bank now in case this happens again? So what can you do to reassure the bank that you can see your way through a lockdown? So I think grouping the risks under headings. So I've just given you finance and I've given you the COVID hygiene element that is so big reputationally for anybody who's in the who's in the hospitality business, like for instance, the great the great work we've heard that Doolies have been doing, this is front and center for them, without a question. I I kind of hope that helps in the short time available. Uh, I think uh, I think another risk we should potentially look at in the future is the environmental one. I think that's going to be a big one for us. Um, you know, as, uh, we're an island, we're agriculture based island, so risk is is very much around with regard to the environment. But but super thoughts there, uh, John. I really appreciate it. Uh, Kira, I'm going to come to you next. Um, we've got a, an interesting question in. Um, uh, you have a wealth of experience with PwC with, with regard to SMEs, but also in international firms. 
uh, big challenge actually for our economy is, is talent. Um, so it's both attracting and then retaining talent. And a, a natural pro- output of that is employee well-being. And employee well-being, we look at the physical well-being, obviously, of the employee, but also the emotional and, and the mental well-being of, of our employees. Do you have any thoughts um, for people listening here today with regard to reopening and employee well-being? Thanks, Eric. Yes, I do. And I think you've already nailed the, the, the issue, which is around looking at it from both the physical and the mental well-being uh, dimensions. I said in my presentation how important it is, the decisions that we make and how we behave now send such massive signals to our, um, our employees, current and future, our suppliers, our customers. So always have that, I suppose, at the front of your mind. When we think about physical and mental well-being in the context of a COVID world, I think on the physical side, you know, John's talked a lot about the health and safety side of things. And it really is important that all of the measures are taken to create a safe working environment where that is possible. And also to encourage people to behave in a way that supports that safe working environment and all the habits we've all started to learn in our own personal lives today. And I think it's also relating to and the capacity and productivity issue that Catherine mentioned in relation to being really careful about the distribution of workloads and making sure that's fair and equitable distribution of tasks and activities across the teams that people are managing. On the emotional side of things, I guess this is an area that has really, it's probably an unanticipated uh, gap in some of our line managers that we've seen across clients that we worked with where this ask is now upon them and they maybe feel uncertain about how to deal with that themselves. So the first thing I think is understand that your management structures within the organization understand both of those dimensions of well-being and understand how to access resources and to support people. So the line manager piece is incredibly important. Making sure that staff know what resources are available to them, whether that's within the organization through an EAP or just the the, the broad range of resources that are available to us as, as, you know, general population available charities and advice lines and so on that we can create an easy path for people to be able to access those services and then I think there's something for me around social resilience so we talk a lot about personal resilience which I think is really really important for everybody now but you you have to try and create a proxy of social resilience through teaming people together creating uh, peer groups that can engage with each other check in with each other and just create a bit of strength in numbers around having the same experiences, sharing tips and practices that are working for them by way of their daily routines or ways that they can actually take care of themselves in the, in the self-care space. So it's looking at it from physical and mental, but it's also looking at it from what we can do as an organization and what we can help our organization help themselves to uh, take care of each other as well. Yeah, super, super answer on that. Great. I think the peer groups is interesting because in a family business, you've got peer groups at different levels. So you've obviously got employees and employees, we can create peer groups. But I also think it's very important um, and haven't spoken with, at this stage, thousands of CEOs in a family business. I think support and emotional support for a lot of CEOs is, is a very important thing for a family business. And the reason I say that is, and I suspect some of you are sitting here today, it's the family business CEO position is, a, is an amazing position. It's a lovely position to be leading your business, you know, head of your family. You know, you're giving opportunity to your next generation. But also it can be a very lonely place when potentially like this, things are difficult or challenging. So I think the need to check in with dad, I'm just like, dad, how are things going? And I get you got to figure out how do you have that question with him. But I do think the emotional aspect and the well-being of not just the employees, but the wider family is, is crucial. Catherine, I'm going to come to you next, uh, if that's okay. Um, I've got a, we got a, a tweet that just came in about seven or eight minutes ago. and The government is moving forward with our, our timelines. But we have a family business, they don't say who they are, but they've, they're saying that the lockdown or the rec- to recovery, they're not opening till the end of the summer. And they're like, what are we going to do with cash flow? Um, any thoughts around cash flow, financial planning for the end of the summer? Yes, um, that, that's really important. And that's affecting a lot of businesses. And I think the really important thing, uh, without repeating what I said already, just in terms of that cash flow, if you're going to be closed till the end of the summer, First of all, go through, I would encourage you to look at any of those supports. Um, not sure it was it Tina or Margaret Dooley who mentioned, which of them mentioned there about realizing somebody wasn't paying them that should be. We're talking about minute detail of what you can do. 
I repeat, look at whoever you're paying. Is there a way that you can agree with them? Obviously, you want, don't want to do it without agreement. But one thing I would say is banks are absolutely welcoming of, certainly speaking for AIB and have no issue with customers looking for deferred loan repayments for the three months that have already gone or indeed the next three months. And you can either repay that over the rest of your loan if you don't want to affect your cost of credit in the well marginally, or you can add it on, you can, you can add it on to the six months at the end. And even just deciding, well, I'll do that for now and I might decide I don't need it later and you can just pay that, that cash flow sum off. So that's the first thing. The second thing I would say is don't be afraid to go to your bank at all and say, okay, I'm not making any money right now. I have no cash flow coming in. That is perfectly understandable. Then apply optimism to your business, but realism to your cash flow. So what is going to happen? Go in with your cash flow plan. We are accepting, if you like, abridged accounts. We are saying to people, look, we're trying to keep it easy. The, the key thing for us is show us your cash flow, show us how you're going to return to profit. The other thing I might say, Eric, just very briefly, if, if I can, is that don't assume it's an overdraft. I mean, if you think it's an overdraft and that will work for you, that's absolutely fine. But do think about, there's an over-reliance on the overdraft in the Irish market. Do say to yourself, well, actually, would I be better off paying this in equal installments? Maybe I should say to the bank, actually, can I take a loan? Can I not pay you for the next six months? And then can I pay you off over the following two and a half years or three years or whatever you need? And without going into the detail of the government support, some of those government supports can go out as far as 10 years. There's a, there's a scheme called the Future Growth Loan Scheme. There are, there are different schemes for different sized businesses with different criteria applying to them. But if you're closed till the end of the summer, just be very realistic, optimistic, as I say, about your business, about what you do need, and then come and ask, ask for help. Um, the other thing you were talking about CEOs, and it's so true, it's, it's a fabulous, it's, it's a privileged position um, with, with, with great a power as, as I, I think this was a quote from, would you believe Spider-Man, but with great power comes great responsibility. So it is lonely at the top, but ask for help. The, the one thing I find is CEOs tend to think they have to have all the answers, they don't. So your own team will probably have fabulous ideas, your bank, your financial advisor, your, your lawyer, your accountant, there are lots of people, other businesses like you can help. Um, and that's probably stating the obvious, but in terms of just get into the minutiae, because businesses, naturally they don't find cash flows exciting. That's not their purpose. That's not their why they exist, but it is one of the most important things they can mind right now. And all of the banks, and certainly speaking for AIB, stand ready to help. Um, great words, thank you. Um, I'm gonna come to, to you, Paul, for, for the last question. Um, Collaborative approach to, to returning to work and, and you know, what I mean by employer, employer, employee and collaborative approach to, to running, returning to work policies and procedures. Uh, it's very much not just a top down anymore. It's very much a, a bottom up and I'll meet you kind of some halfway. Any thoughts about how to engage the employees in the formation of returning to work policies and procedures? Yeah, so the return to work protocol was designed with a, collab a collaborative approach in mind. So one of the first things that an employer has to do is to uh, appoint an employee representative. Um, and for many businesses, that will be a new thing where they will haven't really engaged in that way before. Uh, but that's the first one of the first steps they have to take. And I think from then on, it's really a case of actually engaging with that representative and not just simply having it as uh, a bit like the, uh, the person looks after the fire drill twice a year. But actually, actually, actively engaging that person uh, throughout the sort of uh, stages as we move back into a full, well, what is hopefully a full recovery. Yeah, super words, super words, um, folks. We've just uh, just over our, our, um, allocated time for for the Q and A, so I'm just going to uh, draw to a close. But I just want to give a, a real sincere thanks for very much our international audience. So obviously, we we speakers coming from Ireland here, but also very much from across the world. I know some of you had to to get up quite early this morning. So. Uh, thanks to, to Tina and Margaret uh, in, in Waterford, uh, Jim Davis in, in Utah, John Sutherland in, in, in the UK, uh, Kira Fallon in PwC, Catch Maroney in, in, in AIB, and, and finally there, Paul Goff from Beecham's. Really sincere thanks, folks, and thanks for believing in what we're doing here in, in DCU, so thank you. Um, for, for the rest of, of the audience, I, I hope you enjoyed it. Um, kind of put my lecture hat on or teacher hat on, I hope, as you sit there and have your, your cup of tea, 
you have three or four points you've taken from it. Um, that's what I always encourage people. What are the three things you've taken from that? If you're going to have a, if you're meet somebody, see what are the three things that are important for you? Is it you know the importance of risk assessment? Is it new opportunities coming from COVID? Is there something there to do with, with cash flow management? So I hope there was some value uh, for it. Um, some people have asked, and we tweeted in earlier on asking Eric, what was the email address with regard to if I want to ask a question, I want to get some more information back. It's familybusiness at dcu.e. So by all means, just send us an email and we'll, we'll come back to you on that. Um, with the COVID-19 information series, um, this is the 10th uh, event we've had. So and, and the next one is going to be sometime uh, in, in the August, September period. My last comment is, um, I'd encourage you to get involved. Um, we're trying to make the team or the thematic flow of this somewhat dynamic so if you have a thought if you have an opinion on what you'd like to see a next topic or theme of an event to be you drop us a mail drop us a tweet and we can maybe work uh, around that theme or that topic i hope you enjoyed it and i wish you uh, a very pleasant day thank you very much